So good afternoon and welcome back, ladies and gentlemen, to University Malaya Science Exhibition 2021 final sharing session. And the video displayed was from Virtual Science Fair 2021 sponsor. And we would like to extend our sincerest gratitude towards Kananga Investors for your sponsorship for VSF's science exhibition. And ladies and gentlemen, once again, on behalf of the organizing committee, I would like to welcome you to University of Malaya Science Exhibition brought to you by Virtual Science Fair 2021. I am Tainmoli Sekarin and I will be hosting the event today and I have been doing so far. And we're currently in our third and final session and we have a very interesting sharing session coming up by Mr. Shafiq about a final year presentation associated with biotechnology. And so again, thank you, Mr. Shafiq, Roslan, for taking your time to be a part of our event today. So Mr. Shafiq here is a biotechnology student at the University of Naya, and without further ado, I would like to invite Mr. Shafiq to talk about his field of expertise, and the virtual stage is all yours, sir. Thank you, Tanmali, our lovely MC for today. So let me first um, share my screen. Okay, I hope you can see my slides. I'm gonna make uh, make it full screen right now. So, hi everyone. Um, I hope everyone is doing well. And to all the Muslims, Salam Ramadan and happy fasting. My name is Muhammad Shafiq bin Ruslan. I am a fourth year Bachelor of Science in Biotechnology student at the Institute of Biological Sciences, University of Malaya. So, I actually finished my seventh and final semester of my bachelor's degree studies last January. So I'm currently unofficially graduated, lah, but I'm only going to have my graduation ceremony at the end of this year, uh, coming this uh, November. So enough about me. Let's get on with this um, sharing session. So for this final year project sharing session, well, since this is the last session, I'm just going, it's just going to be a very casual and very laid back session. I'm just going to ramble about my final year project for 45 minutes. Um, so first, I'm going to introduce to you guys to my project background, what the project was all about. And then uh, I'm going to talk about my final year project experience, or as we call it, FYP. Um, so in this section, um, I'll be going through the methodology and a little bit on the results and discussion. Um, to be honest, my project was quite complicated. Uh, I know that some of the audience um, are people from other fields, not necessarily biology or biotechnology, and some of you might even be pre-university students or secondary school students, which is great. But um, for that reason, uh, I'll try to explain the scientific details as best as I could. But if you find it difficult to understand some of the concepts, it's totally fine. Don't worry, don't be scared, don't feel discouraged. The purpose of the sharing session is not that so you could understand every single thing. The purpose of the sharing session is so that you can you are introduced to the techniques and you can have a glimpse into the undergraduate research world in biotechnology at the University of Malaya. So after that, I'm going to share some reflection and thoughts on the previously conducted final year project. And if we have the time, um, maybe I'm, I'll share some advice and FIP preparation. <laughs> uh, and then lastly, we're going to have our Q&A session. So um, if you have any questions as I'm presenting, feel free to drop the questions in the chat down below. And then I'll address the questions at the end of the session. So without further ado, let's begin. So, oh, OK. Uh, this is a screenshot of uh, a post by uh, the official Instagram account of UM Biotech Club. So shameless plug, go check this out. Um, we post uh, very cool stuff on there, including final year projects. So my final year project was titled Identification of Genetic Polymorphisms in NFKPA B in Heterectis Magnificasi in Amnes in Peninsular Malaysia. So. There are a lot of facets, there are a lot of areas in biotechnology. You know, we have animal biotechnology, plant biotechnology, um, bioprocess technology, post-harvest technology, and so on. So my final year project, 
it's more on the um, molecular genetics side of biotechnology where uh, we study DNA uh, on marine organism, which is the sea anemone. So let's look at the caption here. Supervised by Dr. Noradila Mama Fauzi and co-supervised by Dr. Nur Ariana Rajab, Shafiq is doing research on identifying genetic polymorphisms in NF Kappa B in the sea anemone Heteractis magnifica from two different locations in Peninsula Malaysia, Pulau Paya and Pulau Perhentian through DNA sequencing. So what does this mean? I mean, it sounds cool, but what does it really mean? So let me explain to you the project background or what the project was all about. So first, let's look at sea anemones. Sea anemones are marine invertebrates that lives in various habitats, but mostly can be found living in tropical waters like those surrounding Peninsular Malaysia. So sea anemones possess tentacles to capture food and stinging capsules called medocytes to protect themselves against predators and to capture prey. So if you look at these pictures, the wavy like things are tentacles and they, they, they have needocytes, so they can actually sting you. And when they sting you, it hurts. So as does uh, other organisms, sea anemones are often found having symbiotic relationship with other organisms in its ecosystem. Uh, for example, clownfish and photosynthetic algae. So if you ever watch Finding Nemo, which I'm sure many of you do, um, you might realize that Nemo and his father lives in a sea anemone. So have you ever wondered why? Why do they live in these things? So I'll let you think about this and um, we'll come back to this question at the end of the session. So, okay, because they have uh, symbiotic relationships with other organisms, sea anemones are important in maintaining a balanced coral reef ecosystem. So for my final year project, we focused on a species of sea anemone called Heteractis magnifica. So uh, in these pictures right here, uh, all of these are Heteractis magnifica sea anemones. They are very beautiful. As the name suggests, Heteractis magnifica. <laughs> they are truly magnificent creatures of the sea. So Heteractis magnifica are, is a species of sea anemone that lives in the coral reefs on the east and west coast of Peninsular Malaysia and also throughout the marine waters in the Indo-Pacific region. Okay, so in recent years, due to gratifying increase in climate change, environmental stress occurs more frequently. So what is environmental stress? Environmental stress are changes in environmental conditions that may affect the biological functions of organisms. So these changes can be in temperature, water turbidity, pH, salinity, etc. So compared to land organisms, marine organisms are more susceptible towards environmental stress especially sessile invertebrates like sea anemones. So sessile means they can't move. Let me give you an analogy. As humans, we can move. So let's say our room suddenly gets hot. We can simply get up and walk to another room where there's aircon or something. But sea anemones, because they can move, when their surrounding changes, there's not much they can do physically. So what can they do? So as a way of adaptation to these stresses, organisms implement, uh, organisms including sea anemones implement environmental stress response. So environmental stress response is an internal mechanism involving activation of intracellular signaling pathways, uh, where ne uh, a network of genes and transcription factors work together to invoke certain physiological responses. Which brings us to the nf kappa b transcription factor so if you're wondering dari tadi what is this strange looking k thing right here okay good one Rick. that's because that's not the letter k it's the greek letter kappa so this abbreviation is called nf kappa b so in many organisms including us humans nf kappa b or uh, which is short for nuclear factor kappa like chain enhancer of, of activated b cells is important for regulating immune and stress response. But before that, what is a transcription factor? A transcription factor is, a, is actually a protein that um, helps in the regulation of, uh, of gene expression. So in particular, NF-kappa-B plays a key role in regulating environmental stress response, as I discussed earlier, in cnidarians like corals and sea anemones. 
So in varying environments, studies have shown that there are genetic polymorphism in the NF-kappa B gene of different populations of sea anemones. So genetic polymorphism means variation in DNA sequence. So this sentence means when uh, scientists study different populations of sea anemones living in different environments, they found that there are variation in the DNA sequence in the NF-kappa B gene. So when we study this variation, it can actually help us understand how these organisms adapt to different environment and climates. So that's one study in particular by Sullivan and others in 2009. They found that there are naturally occurring polymorphism at residue 67 within the REL homology domain, RHD, in the NF-kappa B of nematostella vectensis, C anemones, which affects DNA binding affinity. So what this means is just that, so Sullivan did a study on a species of C anemone called nematostella vectensis. And when they study the different populations living in different environments, they found that at a particular spot in the NF-kappa B gene, there is variation in the DNA sequence. And this particular spot is the residue 67 within the homology domain. So this variation has been found to affect the efficiency at which the NF-kappa B transcription factor binds to DNA. Yeah, so cool. <laughs> so this brings us to my final year project. So from, for this study, we focus on identifying genetic polymorphisms at residue 67 within REL homology domain in NF-kappa B in the C anemone heteractis magnetica, which I introduced to you earlier from two different locations, Pulau Paya and Pulau Pohenkian, through DNA sequencing. So, these two locations were chosen due to the difference in water turbidity. So, water turbidity in Malay means kekeruhan air. So, based on data and other previous studies, it has been found that in um, the waters of uh, the Straits of Malacca, which Pulau Paya is situated in, has always been found to be naturally more turbid or naturally more keruh compared to uh, the waters of South China Sea, which Pulau Pohenkian is uh, situated in. So we hypothesized that the sea anemones living in Pulau Paya, uh, their living environment is more stressful. So because of this, we want to see whether there are any variation in their DNA sequence in the NF-kappa B gene. So this is the... Um, a very simplified diagram of the of my methodology. Um, so basically, the general idea was first to select the samples, and then we extract DNA from the uh, sea anemones, and then uh, by using the technique called polymerase chain reaction or PCR, we make multiple copies of the NF kappa B gene fragment uh, from the extracted DNA. And then uh, we send these fragments for DNA sequencing. And then we assess the genetic polymorphism or the variation in the DNA sequence. Um, however, uh, as always in research, it's not always that simple. Um, there was a problem as in um, the, the NF-kappa B sequence for this particular species of C anemone, uh, Heteractis magnetica has never been sequenced by anyone ever before. So there are no previous study that we can refer to that describes the uh, PCR amplifi amplification of NF-kappa B for this particular species of C anemone. So that's why we needed to do optimization of PCR amplification of NF-kappa B for heteratis magnetica. And this include um, designing our own PCR primer and also optimizing the PCR conditions of the design NF-kappa B primers. Yeah, so if you're getting lost right now because there's too much science getting thrown at you, it's fine because now we're gonna talk about my FYP experience. Yay, so, okay. The project started with sample selection. So samples of heteractis magnifica C anemones were selected from preserved samples in the Environmental Biology Lab, Institute of Ocean and Earth Sciences, IOES, University of Malaya. So um, I know what you're thinking. Did I go diving to collect the samples at Pulau Paya and Pulau Pintian? No, I didn't. 
I, I can't even swim. So yeah, it, it, it would be nice though. Okay, so actually the samples were previously collected for a, a research project by a master's degree student at IOES. So I just tumpang guna their samples lah. So instead of diving in the sea, I just dived into the freezer in the lab to collect the samples. So a total of 20 individual samples were selected, 10 samples from Pulau Paya and 10 samples from Pulau Perhentian. So in this raga orange right here are the sea anemone samples. Um, so when, when they went sampling, they cut a portion of the tissue and then they placed them in these glass vials right here. So in this, uh, in this like uh, jar thing right here are the sea anemone samples. Lah. So next, we carried out DNA extraction on the sea anemone samples. So genomic DNA was extracted from the H. magnifica samples using the nucleospin tissue kit by Macrinegal following the manufacturer's instructions with small modifications. So, okay, uh, in the top uh, left picture is the C anemone sample before extract, at the beginning of the extraction. So we just take a small portion of the tissue, the pedal disc tissue. We need just about like 50 milligrams. Um, cut it into smaller pieces and then put it into a tube and then like just carry out with the instructions lah. Actually, this the DNA expression is my favorite part of the whole thing because it's so much fun. Um, it's not difficult to just follow instructions, but there's a lot of uh, pipetting solutions, uh, my, uh, centrifugation. Um, um, but most, most of all, there's a lot of waiting lah. So if you look at the bottom uh, left picture this is the c anemone sample in the middle of the extraction so in the middle of the uh, process there is one step that says to incubate the sample at 56 degrees celsius for four hours with uh shaking of the sample every 30 minutes so yeah that's the that's why there's a lot of waiting and at the end of the extraction, this is what you get. Uh, as you can see in the picture in the bottom right, uh, you get a clear solution of DNA. So this is the heterogeneous magnifica DNA. Um, one session of DNA extraction takes about six to seven hours. So yeah, it takes a long time, but it's not difficult. Uh, in the back there is my FYP lab mate. His name is Farid. Hi, Farid. <laughs> So next, we extract the DNA sample. We carry out quality as assessment. So, okay, I had 20 samples, but I didn't extract all at once. I just, um, I just do like f uh, three to four samples at once because we need to carry out quality assessment uh, every single time. So the concentration and purity of extracted DNA was quantified using nanodrop spectrophotometer. So uh, if you look at this picture in the top right corner, this, is, uh, this monitor shows the nanodrop reading of the concentration of the sample, and uh, concentration of DNA in the sample, and also how pure is the DNA, whether it's pure DNA or there's any impurity in the sample. So next, the integrity of the extracted DNA was assessed by using agarose gel electrophoresis. So, if you are a pre-university student, you might already learn that agarose gel electrophoresis is a technique where we can use to separate DNA according to their size. So it can also be used to check the integrity of extracted genomic DNA. So let's look at this uh, gel picture right here. So for samples PE7, PE9, and PE10, these are good because there's one clear band at the top with some smearing, which means that um, most of the genomic DNA is still intact, but so, uh, some are fragmented, For which for my purposes, it's fine. But for samples P5 and PE6, it's not good because there's no one band, um, just some slight smearing in the middle there, which you can barely see. So these samples are not good, lah, and we might have to extract again. So. Once I extracted the samples, I made a spreadsheet containing all the, uh, all the details of these samples. So I included the concentration, the purity uh, readings, uh, so that it's easier for me to keep track of the samples. 
So extracted DNA were then purified using G-Matrix PCR DNA cleanup purification kit. So this purification step is necessary to um, eliminate any residual uh, impurities from the DNA sample. So next is the so next step is the optimization of PCR amplification of NF kappa B in heterotis magnifica. So okay, the <laughs> connect. Okay, um, at this step, um, is actually a huge part of the project. Um, okay, to be honest, this uh, this part onwards is kind of complicated, but I'll try my best to explain lah. So this step involves three, three phases. The first phase is PCR primer design. So okay, uh, PCR or polymerase, polymerase chain reaction is a technique that can be used to make multiple copies of DNA fragments. So in PCR reactions, you need a few things. You need your DNA template, you need your uh, DNA polymerase to catalyze the amplification, and you also need your PCR primer. So PCR primers are short sequences or short DNA sequences, about 20 nucleotides, which you can actually see in this top, top picture right here, Sullivan reverse primer. And okay, this is the this is what a primer looks like. Lah. So, so in PCR reaction, so uh, PCR primer, their role is to recognize the spot on the DNA template where you want to make multiple copies of and it binds to the DNA template. So in PCR reactions, uh, primers works in pairs. There's forward primer and then there's reverse primer. This is because, as we know, DNA, DNA is double-stranded. So forward primer will bind to one strand, and then the reverse primer will bind to another strand, and then the DNA amplification begins from there. So yeah, that's about PCR primer. So in designing PCR primer, um, it's best if we can get the PCR to be specific to the DNA template. This means that the, the sequence between the PCR primer and the DNA template is similar or almost exactly similar. But this is hard to do because we didn't have the NF kappa B sequence from the specifically from heterotis magnificasi in Amini. So what we had to do is we did multiple sequence alignment, as you can see in the top picture, uh, of NF kappa B sequences from Nematostylovectensis, which is the C anemone species that Sullivan worked on, as well as several species of C anemone, uh, 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 Actinioidea as Heterectis magnifica, using Mega X software. So this is so that we can find highly conserved regions for designing PCR primers. So if you look at this alignment right here, so this like A, G, C, G thing right here is uh, uh, the DNA basis. So you can see that some of some regions are the same across all five uh, sequences. So these regions are prioritized while designing the primers because theoretically, when these regions are the same in this alignment, there is a high chance that it is also the same in Heteractis magnifica, which we don't have the sequence of. So the primers were designed using Primer, T, Primer 3 Plus software, which you can see in the uh, left here, this picture. So it looks fancy, but it's just a website which you can find on the internet. Uh, it allows us to design primers from uh, DNA sequence. So you just put your DNA sequence right here in this box. I just use one. Uh, I just use one of the sequence from the alignment, and then you can specify the excluded region, the target region, the included region, and then you click pick primers, and then it will design the primer for you. So uh, this process, there's just a lot of trying, trial and error. Like you, you have to try different things and see what works and what, what not. So once you design, once we design the primer, uh, the characteristics and quality of the design primers will assess by using net primer software so this is the software in the bottom left picture right here it is also a website which you can find online so you just put your primer sequence and it has algorithm whereby it does calculations on several parameters that allows us to assess the quality of the primers 
which is very cool. I don't know how they do that, actually. <laughs> so a total of 25 sets of primers were designed and assessed in terms of their esti estimated annealing temperature, feasibility of primer dimer formation, and also the placement of the primers on the reference nf kappa b sequence. So um, the, the annealing temperature and the feasibility of primer dimer formation can be assessed through the net primer software. I would like to highlight the feasibility of primer dimer formation. So primer dimers occurs when the primers, instead of binding to the DNA template, it instead binds to themselves or with other, uh, other primers. So this is bad luck because once this happens, there's, there will be less DNA amplification because the primers didn't bind to the DNA template. So um, the net primer can actually give a reading that allows us to assess the how likely it is for primer dimer to form. So uh, in the top picture right here is another spreadsheet that I made containing details of all the design primer sequences uh, along with the uh, quality assessment. And I give consensus to each of the design primer, whether they are good, whether they are not. If it's really, really good, I would say amazing like that. So after assessing the quality and the characteristics of the design primers, two primer pairs were chosen to be used for PCR. Uh, the primer pairs were named Shafiq Roslan Primer Set 1 and Shafiq Roslan Primer Set 2, SR01 and SR02. So um, the table right here shows the details of the uh, Shafiq Roslan and of Kappa B primers. And at the bottom right picture is the placement of the primers on the reference and of Kappa B sequence, which in this case is the of kappa b sequence from the nematostella vectensis c in me okay so the next phase is the evaluation of viability of extracted h magnetica dna for pcr so before we actually go forward with uh pcr for the using the uh design nf kappa b primers we must check first whether the extracted dna can actually work for pcr so this was carried out using mitochondrial cytochrome C oxidase subunit 1, CO1 primers. So for this uh, optimization, I extracted 20 samples, right? So I only used like three and kept it consistent throughout uh, because uh, at this stage, we're just trying out different things. So PCR assays were carried out using different uh, volumes of DNA per reaction. We tried out two microliter and then four microliter, and also tried out using purified and unpurified cataractase magnifica DNA. So let's look at these gel pictures right here. We can actually see a stark difference, a significant difference between using four microliter DNA uh, compared to two microliter DNA. And uh, I don't think you can see that much, but uh, using purified uh, uh, DNA actually yields brighter bands compared to unpurified uh, samples. So in conclusion, PCR using 4 microliter of purified DNA yielded the brightest bands. So that's why uh, this condition is used for further uh, PCR assays using the nf kappa B primers, which I'm going to talk about now. <laughs> So yeah, the optimization uh, using nf kappa B primers was carried out using primers from Sullivan and others, 2009, as well as the Shafiq Roslan nf kappa B primers, S1, SR01, and SR02. So this was done by testing out various thermocycling conditions. So if you look at the top picture, this um, hand-drawn diagram right here is the, one of the thermocycling conditions that we try out. So I want, you, I want to shift your attention to the, the middle of the diagram, the 55 degrees Celsius. So that uh, is the annealing step of the PCR. PCR has three steps, denaturation, uh, annealing, and the elongation. So the annealing step is the temperature at which the PCR primers bind to the DNA template. So we mainly kept the denaturation and the elongation temperatures constant. We played around only with the annealing temperature. It's either 55 degree, uh, 60 degree, etc. So from the PCR assays that were carried out, we tried out various different things. Multiple fragments were amplified, as can be seen in the gel pictures. Uh, each of them with different sizes and intensity. But 
some fragments were consistently amplified in almost all of the PCR assays. So this include an approximately 500 base pair fragments and 300 base pair fragments in uh, reactions using Sullivan and SR02 primers, and also an approximately 300 base pair fragments and an approximately 150 base pair fragments in reactions using the SR01 primers. So if you're wondering, I designed my primers, how, how can I use them? So um, when, we uh, when we have the primer sequence, we send the sequence to a company where they will synthesize the PCR primer for us. And when it arrives to us, it comes like this in the uh, bottom left picture right here. So the primers comes in tubes and we have to do some further processing lah, before we can be used in PCR reactions. So the presence of these fragments are a good thing. However, <laughs> there's something that is not good. Uh, what do you think it is? Okay, let me tell you. So uh, you must notice that uh, there are in these gel pictures, there are lanes that says H2O. H2O here, H2O here, H2O here. So what does this mean? So H2O uh, is the no template negative control, where in that uh, PCR reaction, instead of so uh, instead of putting DNA template, uh, we put in ultra pure sterilized water, ultra pure sterilized distilled water. So yeah, while all the PCR reagents are kept the same. So theoretically, because there's no DNA in the reaction. Uh, there will be no amplification and there should be no bands in the gel. But oh, you can see that some of the gel, some of the lanes, uh, some of the H2O lanes has some bands. So this is not good because the presence of bands in the water control signifies the presence of contamination. So once you have bands in your water control, no matter how good your other lanes are, how good your other samples are, how pretty are your other bands, it kind of invalidates the whole thing. So yeah, that's why uh, we carry out PCR assays to figure out the source of contamination. And this step includes uh, doing resuspension of PCR primers, using different sets of pipettes and tips, using different sets of PCR reagents, we even go as far as conducting PCR at a different laboratory. So this actually can be seen in the top uh, left picture right here. So this is PCR using Gandler CO1 primers and nf -Kappa b primers at a different laboratory. That's why the gel picture is looking so weird. So, okay, let's discuss this. Uh, this is SV is Sullivan primer. So the H2O has bands. Uh, SR02 primers, the water control also has bands. But for CO1 primers, the water control has no bands. It's so clean. So this means that the Sullivan and SR02 primer tubes were contaminated. Hmm, mystery solved. So because of that, subsequently, we carry out PCR using the SR01 primers. And we found that based on, if you look at these gel pictures, there are no contamination. The, the H2O lanes were both clean. So that's really good. And then uh, there are amplification of uh, an approximately 300 base pair and 150 base pair fragments. As you can see right here, uh, which is similar to the one uh, in the PCR ACs uh, earlier that I showed you. And when we increase the annealing temperature to 60 degrees Celsius, the bands becomes much, much brighter. So these bands are like very thick and juicy. And these are like the prettiest PCR bands that I have ever seen in my life. So that's why uh, using the SR01 primers at this annealing temperature, uh, we, uh, we chose this condition for future work involving sequencing and assessment of genetic polymorphism. So the plan was, to extract these fragments, these bands right here, uh, we do this by actually cutting the gel using a blade, I'm not kidding, uh, cutting the, the fragment that we want and then purifying it using a kit. 
and then uh, this will be sent for sequencing. So instead of having uh, multiple bands uh, in one lane, uh, it can be separated. Uh, so when we run on another gen, it, uh, it becomes uh, in two different lanes, which, uh, which uh, will be easier for us to send for sequencing. Lah. OK, so that was the plan. Uh, the, the PCR using SR01 primer at 60 degree uh, annealing temperature. Uh, uh were chosen for future work but then this happened <laughs> okay yeah so because this happened uh we had to stop all of the lab work everyone in uh my uh, even my friends uh, uh had to do the same so all lab work has to be discontinued uh we had to stay at home and abide by the perintah kawalan pergerakan so how how do i finish my final year project i mean even though we can't continue with the lab work we still have to finish writing the thesis right so let's take a look back at this diagram right here so the top three uh steps were pre-mco and then the post-mco i didn't get to do the the uh the last three steps lah, which is the pcr of the targeted region in a kappa b which are uh, using the sr01 primers on all 20 samples that I extracted, and then do gel extraction and purification. And then finally, Barula, we, uh, we can do the DNA sequencing and assessment of genetic polymorphism. So because uh, this part of the project cannot be conducted physically at the lab, uh, we had to resort to doing more of a literature review kind of work instead of a physical lab work. So. In, uh, in, in my thesis, instead of discussing about uh, what I have done, instead of discussing my results, we actually discussed what we would expect the results to be based on other published study or other, other published uh, research projects lah, uh, out there uh, based on articles. So, um, yeah. <laughs> Uh, yeah, I was really sad because uh, the last thing that I'd done uh, is the optimization of PCR conditions of NF kappa B primers, which I kind of successfully did uh, with the amplification from the SR01 primers. But then I didn't actually get to finish the project and actually assess the genetic polymorphism or assess the variation in the DNA sequence between the different populations of C anemones in Pulau Paya and Pulau Pohentian. So yeah, that was actually kind of sad. Uh, okay, now I'm just going to ramble. <laughs> I'm just going to rant about that because I was so disappointed with the MCO, but well, uh, it's not anyone's fault. Uh, things are were beyond our control. But actually looking back, um, despite being sad that I didn't get to finish the project, I actually uh, felt quite satisfied with what I have accomplished um, as far as the lab work goes because um, comparing to other students facing the same thing, I actually managed to do quite a lot. I managed to collect quite uh, a number of... Uh, no collect quite an amount of data for my final year project uh, as you can see from the pictures or all the the, the uh, yeah the pictures that I've shown you so uh, yeah so for that reason I'm 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 sad but not too sad because yeah I'm actually quite lucky because I did quite a lot of things but yeah in if I can turn back time, how, uh, of course, I would really love to actually being able to finish the project because, as I mentioned earlier, um, the NF kappa B gene for from heterat for heterotis magnificase in Amini has never been sequenced before. So, if I was able to send these NF kappa B gene fragments for sequencing, I will possibly be the first person in the world to actually sequence NF kappa B for this particular species of C in ME, which is really cool, right? So yeah, I didn't get to do that. Yeah, but it, it's fine lah. 
So yeah, um, my favorite part of the project was the DNA extraction, as I mentioned, because it's so much fun. I get to like uh, sit around in the lab for seven hours, uh, pipettes, uh, pipette solutions in the sample, and then centrifuge, and then just, and I wait. Yeah, it's so much fun. The my least favorite part of the project was the contamination thing. That was so annoying. <laughs> um, from from what I explained to you, you might you might be like, ah lah, like the nicotine is like contamination is but that contamination thing, uh, trying to figure out the source of contamination, uh, actually took about four to five weeks away from my final year project. I mean, I tried out, I tried out this, I tried out that. Contamination still happens, and I was really frustrated. And like, um, <clears throat> because I tried out different things and things still didn't work, I still have contamination. I'm like, huh, maybe, maybe uh, these things happen. It's just because of me. I am the source of failure. I, uh, I, I thought to myself, lah, at that point. And I didn't realize how how overly dramatic I was being at that time. <laughs> so, but luckily, despite those problems, I was blessed with two very, very, very helpful, very dedicated, very knowledgeable, very caring supervisors that um, uh, gave me a lot of advice and uh gave me like pep talks on the problem i mean they they never once um shy from giving me uh, attention to every problem for my final year project i remember my co-supervisor dr diana so in one of our meeting session to, uh, where we discuss about the contamination issue she was like it's okay tak Benda ni semua normal. Uh, I'm actually lucky to to be experiencing this at such an early stage, you know, at my FYP uh, as an undergraduate student. Uh, and she said that I'm lucky to experience this now because as FYP student, as an undergraduate, you are not expected to know a lot of things. So you have the guidance of your supervisors and we are here to mentor you. So. You can see how 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 caring she is, yeah. And then also, I also remember my my supervisor, Doctor Adi, Adila. She said that, okay, now that you experience all of these things and you have seen the ups and downs of research, nothing can phase you anymore. Uh, so you are set and ready to go to pursue with your postgraduate uh, studies, either masters or PhD, because yeah. We have already seen how how grueling research can be early on in your FYP. So yeah, because of that, um, I I was motivated by them lah, and I was so not so sad anymore. So I think um okay, it's twelve forty four already. Um, I'm gonna stop my uh, sharing session right here. I hope you enjoyed my sharing session, and I hope you gain uh, a lot of knowledge. And I hope based on what I shared with you, you can see that how much fun it is uh, to do research in biotechnology at the University of Malaya. So yeah, thank you. So uh, I think now we can go ahead with the q and session. I'm going to stop sharing. Okay, question by Fikri Hakimi. Do anemones have genes re rearrangement in the B cell? <laughs> okay, this is a question by a genetic student. Um, I'm sorry, Fikri. <laughs> I, 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 I don't have the answer to your question, but uh, maybe I can, Maybe I can uh, do some reading on this and uh, I can tell you later because I know you personally. <laughs> but yeah, I, I, I don't know the answer to that. 
So I have to uh, do some reading. <coughs> Start a uh, question from Jing Wen. Wow, you have to come out with your own primers. Yes, very cool, right? And uh, I have not come out, lah. Yeah, come out. As in, I have to design my own PCR primers. That's why I can name the primers with my own name. Shafiq Roslan and FKPB Primers, SR01, SR02. How many of you know your friends in your FYP that is able to do that? Not many, right? Able to name primers with their own name. Yeah, very cool. But yeah, as I said, because of that, uh, yeah, the whole thing is very cool. It's just sad that I didn't get to finish the whole project. Otherwise, it would be even cooler. Yeah. So yeah, I think we can go ahead with the next question. Okay, another question from Jing Wen. Uh, if the extracted DNA showed visible band or gel, can skip for purification step? Mm, um, actually, the purification step, I, yeah, it is actually still necessary, even though uh, no, I think you misunderstood what I explained uh, in the slides. Actually, when uh, there's no visible band on the gel for the DNA extraction, uh, this means that the sample is poor, as in most of the DNA is fragmented. So we have to carry out extraction again for that particular sample. But for samples that have um, bands on the gel, this means that the DNA sample is good they are good uh, to be used for PCR. But then, uh, because the uh, DNA is still uh, intact and not fragmented, however, purification step is still needed because even though this DNA is intact and is in good in, ter in terms of the integrity, it still may contain some impurities in the sample. And these impurities can be like, uh, PCR inhibitors or some remainder of proteins, which this is not good for PCR. So that's why a uh, purification step is still needed. Okay, I hope that answers your question. So next question. <laughs> Another question by Fikri, a genetic student. In the mega can, which uh, group source did you use? Fikri, I don't know what our group source means. What, what does it mean? <laughs> so, okay, that's the thing about biotechnology. Uh, we, biotechnology encompasses a lot of areas. Um, so, because we study a lot of things, there's kind of like mix and, mix and matches of things. So, we, so as I mentioned, my project is more on the molecular genetic side, but I, I didn't. Um, study genetics uh, extens extensively, so I just uh, use some of your techniques. So there are um, there may be some uh, some things that I'm I am not familiar with, and I'm, uh, I apologize for that. But yeah, I I, I don't know how to answer your question. I'm so sorry. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, but yeah, I will look up on that, and I will. Uh, I will, I will, I will, I will try to answer that. So next question. So a question by Farhana MGB. How many similar studies related to anemone sequencing and NF-kappa B genes are there in literature? So, um, okay, for, for Nidarians, okay, C anemone and corals, uh, both uh, are in the same, I think it's uh, phylum called Nidaria. So for Nidarians, people uh, concentrate their study more on corals compared to uh, sea anemone. So because of this, I, I'm not sure why, maybe because um, I mean, they are both important you know, ecologically, but yeah, for uh, studies has been concentrating more on coral. Lah. So for sea anemones, um, 
to be honest, there's not much uh, related studies that we could find that uh, relates to sequencing and then kappa B genes. There are a few, but very limited. Uh, actually, this is quite a problem when uh, I'm trying to find references to support my, the discussion part in my thesis. Uh, so we had to resort to just a few, a few paper lah that uh, discuss that uh, studies about uh, this topic. Uh, and then, even then, as I mentioned. Uh, even if there are studies on C anemone regarding sequencing and another kappa B gene, mm -hmm. uh, most of them are on another species of C anemone, not Heteractis magnifica. Yeah. So mm -hmm. uh, when I do my study on Heteractis magnifica, mm -hmm. specifically, it's, it's actually quite difficult lah, because there's no references that I can refer to. Mm -hmm. So next question. Oh, so a question by Anushri Sambantan. Hi, how was it made sure that the only stressor present was water turbidity and not other stresses such as temperature, pH and salinity? Very good question actually. So actually of course, in, in their environment, other, uh, other stressors can also um, uh be a role in uh in uh affecting their environment mm. but we concentrate on of course so to answer your question of course there are other factors uh that uh contributes to the environmental stress between these two populations but we concentrate concentrated as a hypothesis uh based on water turbidity because there are there is data that suggests there is significant data that suggests that are the, that there are water turbidity difference between these two locations other factors such as temperature uh ph or salinity based on data maybe they they are they are dif there are some difference but there's not so much difference between these two locations water the uh, the uh the difference is quite uh significant so that's why lah and um uh, and also because there are other paper or there, there are other studies out there that suggest uh, that water turbidity is a huge uh factor that uh, contributes to the uh, difference in their environment. So yeah, I hope that answers your question. Next question by you, okay, by uh, <laughs> someone with just a metric number. How are you intending to expand your expertise in the field after you graduate? Oh my God, okay, this, this is kind of like a soalan cepumas. <laughs> So yeah, okay, to answer your question, okay, this is the last question, okay, okay. Uh, to answer your question, um, we, we, I'm actually interested in, so I will be pursuing my postgraduate studies in the Master or PhD uh, soon, inshallah, hopefully. So I am interested in doing uh molecular biology or molecular genetics kind of research on marine or no, not marine on animal samples so yeah that's how i how we, i intend to expand my expertise lah so uh so for this final year project i work on marine organism uh which is the sea anemone so if you if you if you search on google See, anemones are actually also animals. They are in the kingdom animalia. They're just in a in a in a different phylum than other animals. So I um I don't limit my uh I don't limit myself to study on marine organisms only. I I am also interested to work on other animals, uh, especially domestic animals such as goats, sheep, cow chicken etc but i'm interested in doing molecular genetics kind of work lah. yeah so i hope you guys um uh i think that's all of the questions
Okay, another question, which uh, I think, yeah, we can have another one. Can ecologists major in biotech too? Sure, why not? As I said, biotech is a very, uh, it's a very broad field. It encompasses many different areas. So if you have, <clears throat> if you have your, um, if you majored in ecology and you want to further your studies in biotechnology, uh, actually, there's quite an overlap actually between the two fields, and I can't see why not you want to major in biotech. Yeah. So, I think that's all for the questions. Yeah. Thank you guys for listening. So, I think this concludes the sharing session, uh, and I will let um, Tenmali uh, take over. Thank you guys. Great, Shafiq. Thank you so so much uh, wait, hold on. oh thank you very much mr shafiq for a very fruitful presentation about biotechs and it's fi your final year project many useful tips and tricks you've given the audience and i hope it will come in handy for many potential biotech students in the nearest time to come so mr shafiq would you like to add a couple of things before we end the session today um yeah, thank you so much for listening to me. I know, like, <laughs> I know I talk a lot, and I know I like to ramble. Even my my all my friends say so, and um, I hope you can gain some uh some uh knowledge, some substantial amount of knowledge from the from what I shared with you today. I know it's quite of an extent. It's quite extensive compared to other sharing sessions. And actually, um, before uh, in preparation for the sharing session, I, I it was actually quite difficult for me to like figure out what to include and what to exclude. But then I thought to myself, if I leave out the complicated things, just for the fact that it's uh, it's going to be difficult for people to understand, then what is the purpose of the sharing session, right? So we have to share the complicated things so that people can learn. If they don't understand um, everything straight away, it's fine because Google is your best friend, right? So yeah, that's all from me. Thank you, guys. Great. Thank you so much once again. Thank you for your time and the effort you put into your presentation today and all the your personal experiences you've shared with us alongside the, your final year project as well. And as for the audience, thank you so much for tuning with the, tuning in with us. Uh, we humbly thank you uh, for having you throughout the uh, science exhibition. And once again, kindly fill up the feedback form uploaded in the live stream chat because your response will be counted in choosing the winner for best presenter. So um, thank you to the audience for having the constant curiosity to learn more about the academic opportunities provided by the student bodies in University of Malaya. The organizing committee is very grateful for your presence throughout the commencement of Virtual Science Fair Science Exhibition. And we truly apologize for any technical glitches occurred throughout the event. I would also like to thank our sponsor again, Kananga Investors Burhad, for sponsoring a very youth empowering educational event and knowledge is never wasted and i hope all of us are always filled with curiosity to learn more and more every day till we meet again this is tainmoli sagrin signing off take care everyone and as for mr shafiq uh we're gonna have a quick photo session so your brightest smile so we can get a great picture as a team One, two, three. Okay, thank you. Thank you, guys.